So um, thank you guys for, for inviting me. Um, I was in Berlin during the festival a few years back, two or three years back. Really enjoyed the conversation we had there. Um, I will, um, this, is, this is from now. This is uh, the last trip with the family in the mountains of Norway. We're in a, in a situation where, where social distancing um, is, is, is a natural thing for us because we're not, we're not that, that many people. Um, I'll cover a few of the elements that I think might be relevant in terms of COVID here in Norway. Um, talk a bit about the involvement of the projects that are relevant. Uh, Joran mentioned two of them. Um, and I'll also talk a bit about our international involvement as that is, is important. And I, I'm personally, I've been a, an, an open source and OER activist for two decades. I think what we're doing here now and what we from the Norwegian side have seen is that the international interaction is what really makes OER different from, from, from sort of more proprietary sort of contained uh, content development. Um, so I think the international perspective for the Norwegian side is, is going to be very important also in the future. Uh, very quickly about us. So we're 5 million people. Um, uh, we have two languages, sort of relevant in terms of, of what, what happened when, when COVID hit and how many people we, we needed to reach with, with OER. Um, just to give you a perspective, you see the map on the right side. It's, two, it's more than 2,600 kilometers from north to south. And for those of you who have been, there are a few Germans that have been driving through our country. You know, it's, it's really, really a long country. And that's social distancing by, by default, actually. Um, and we're also a very, we're not a very Latino type of people. So, so if you're in love with someone, you might look at their shoes instead of your own. So that's, uh, that's very sort of the, the Norwegian style. Um, and that has sort of, in addition to another a bunch of other reasons, uh, has led to COVID not being the same here as it is in, would be in many other countries. Uh, and just to drop one very key, key number, there were only 275 people died so far from the pandemic, which is uh, also relative to the number of people, a very, very low number. Uh, but we had a close down of schools for a longer period uh, before the summer. And at that point, um, we had a very, very high demand for online resources and OER, of course, a part of that, uh, that, um, that perspective. At that point, I think many of the schools who had pads and mobiles as part of the, uh, the, their, their sort of class sets. So my, my daughter, uh, she's, uh, she's in uh, grade nine, all have one, one, one pad or tablet per, per person. Uh, at that point, I don't think the, the teachers had any strategies of actually using them properly in the, in the schools, but they, 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 of course, this is school by school, but in our region, they really turned around quickly and, and sort of learned as, as the pandemic grew and, and, and as the lockdown came. We had the infrastructure. I know Werner mentioned lack of connectivity. That is not relevant in our country. Everyone's online. Um, and everyone has a sort of school-based digital device or more or less everyone has that. And of course that proved to be an advantage for us because we, we could set up something. There's a lot of mishaps. There was a lot of technical issues as the teachers themselves, I would say we're not, I think, ready for it. Um, and, and especially those that are sort of not part of the younger tech uh, sort of savvy generation, they had, the tools available, but they struggled to sort of tap into the to the strategies to use. Um, for NDLA that I'm going to mention later, it was a huge uh, increase in number of visitors uh, at one point, and this is only for upper secondary school. We had 150,000 visitors a day, which is which is very high relatively when you know that the total student population is 180,000. Um, so that's that's nearly everyone every day. Um, and the NDLA portfolio has grown in that in that in that setting. And what we have seen is that some of the private companies that earlier wouldn't touch content from the GD, uh, from the, the NDLA has also started to tap into that resource to build their own portfolio. Because for also for them, the market became really really important to to, to capture immediately um, when that when that came up. I think for us, 
the struggle then was to to really isolate the question around openness because that's going to be important uh, we thought then through the whole pandemic because there was a lot of free resources that was offered in a limited time frame and that was a huge problem for schools that just jumped into collaboration with private companies without asking the relevant question what happens when we've been using your platform for two months and you close it down you know that's that's and, and when we came to that two month period end or three uh, month period end, that ended up being actually a fairly large uh, large large issue and delay of course fully open has has sort of continued to grow uh, during the period um you're on and Werner mentioned h5p it's a tremendous project that has really grown also pre-covid at this point we have 200 million users and that's pretty pretty awesome i'm going to just go back to the map if you see the dot the yellow dot in the northern region um uh on top here that is where ndla now has been uh, h5p now has been developed it's been you know traveling the world and 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 is truly growing growing rapidly um and in a few weeks they will launch uh, um, a um 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 version of h5p that is uh, that is a part of a, a storefront that will be even richer than it is today i'm traveling to the to this team on on monday uh, as we're also moving the the global digital library over to to h5p but again another example of openness being key and implementate and, and an open implementation being key for h h5p i know there's a lot of h5p developers also in in germany uh, one cool thing is that for the first time ever, one of the publishers took open educational resources and put it put it into their own solution at scale. They both tapped into the resources from the Global Digital Library for minority languages in Norway, uh, and they also tapped into resources from NDLA. And that happened uh, was was planned pre-COVID, but really accelerated towards. Um, um, the, the 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 shutdown. This is uh, it's called Elev Kanal, which is um, the student channel from one of the largest um, commercial um, uh, TV channels in in Norway. That also is is a is a publisher. So that's a, that's a really really um, good step forward, um, and a not a un, an uncontroversial one. It was it was really um, something that uh, it it took a while before they they came there. Uh, also, I just want to mention that. Um, at this point, uh, we, we had launched of, or Google launched their own reading app in May, which was in the beginning of the COVID um, uh, situation um, called Read Along. And at that point, they also added resources onto that platform. Though the platform is not open source, the content that they tapped from us and from, from our projects uh, are, would be uh, defined as, as Creative Commons. And even though we want to see startups doing this, smaller companies doing this, I think it's okay that that you know Google shows that that even though they're a, they're a large company, they can tap into to to what we are. I also want to mention that what, one cool thing here is that when the publisher went in and 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 tap into content, they actually took books and stories that came from Cambodia, place that I came from, from Kenya and from India. So today, for the first time, we have had. OER being imported from those projects and into the Norwegian schools. And that's, that's really, really a step in the right direction for us as well, showing that it doesn't have to be content coming from, from Europe or the US being exported to other countries. It could be the other way around. That's a huge leap. Internationally, I'm just going to mention a few of the projects because I think it, it, it might be, be, be relevant. And I'm personally heavily involved in what the Norwegian government is doing. I also want to mention that I'm going to shift my position into the, the foreign ministry and what's called NURAD uh, in two weeks time. So I'm, I'm going to, to be part of, of a more central government. The first thing we did in, when, when we started COVID was that we saw the same problem as Werner mentioned. There are not enough resources in many of the languages that we're trying to reach. So we started a campaign towards uh, together with a bunch of partners uh, learning equality um, that that was also, uh, that Werner also mentioned was part of that. Uh, UNESCO, UNHCR was with us. Uh, a, a large private company in the U.S. called Verizon was there. Creative Commons, uh, of course, uh, a part of the venture. 
And over a period of four and a half weeks, we had to more than 1,200 volunteers translate more than 6,600 um, children book, uh, children's books into to more than 100 languages. And this is a purely volunteer uh, effort, a crowdsourcing uh, uh, sort of feedback that we have never seen before. It was really, really amazing. I, I get chills when I talk about it now because it just proved that people are all around the world, was they were ready um, and they were willing to spend time um, to bring resources to their, uh, their children. And this is only possible because of the open licenses of the books. I mean, just think about the legal implications of trying to translate into more than 100 languages if they were closed as copyright uh, titles. So what we did then, we, we had a translation hackathon over a month, um, really produced thousands of titles. And we also started looking broader into uh, accessing content. I got some extra funding from the Norwegian government as a COVID initiative, and we launched freelearning.io in the beginning of June with 150 languages, also including now German. So there are, there are not many books in German, but there are 36 books currently in, in German, uh, translated by volunteers um, um, uh, from, from English mainly. Um, radio was mentioned for South America. We, we again, did a very, very, had a, a separate team that was able to work with the, the American government that have created radio educational resources in a bunch of languages, invested uh, um, tens of millions of dollars over this, uh, in, into this over the last five years. They had no visibility online, so we created uh, GDL Radio. Uh, and uh, as of now, I think we have uh, covered 18 countries and more than, more than 10,000 uh, podcast episodes or radio shows that are that are, are, are put on, online. This is something that, that was only possible because we we sort of shifted quickly and got funding that was that was uh, that was sourced into the project. And from the time we got this until we had it online, it was only only three weeks. Um, and again, at, at this point, this will be very hard to do in a in a in a out of pandemic situation because there's so many quality issues you want to address. And we, we just decided at this point that we want to remove those barriers because of that dire need of, of resources in many of these countries. Um, and these are all Creative Commons licensed resources. Um, I think we've been working on for a while um, is a more broad initiative that covers more of the open perspectives. I think I had all these open perspectives on my slides in Germany, in Berlin, uh, two or three years ago when I talked there. Now it's become a UN alliance where the Norwegian government has funded the initiation of the Digital Public Goods Alliance. Uh, this alliance focuses on software content and data, and it's truly open. Uh, we pick the software from the OSI list of, of licenses. We accept Creative Commons uh, labeled content, and we have data that is Creative Commons or public domain. All these things would be, would be known to many of you, but it's really been a hard, sort of a hard job to keep it open and truly open as this has sort of been a, a collaboration that is, has been attached to the highest level uh, of the, the general secretary and at, at the UN. It's, um, it's an amazing, uh, an, an amazing uh, initiative that of course goes beyond OER, but that, that sort of has the same principle of openness um, and, and fighting for open solutions for evolving uh, countries that wants to either do large infrastructure projects or, or tap into learning uh, resources. Um, it's really, and this is the project that I'm going to work mostly on when I, when I join the, new, the Norwegian government uh, um, um, in, their, in, in their effort. I just wanna mention one project that are really sort of shows that the, the open perspective of investments in Norway is about to set roots. This is something totally different. These are high quality satellite images that are going to cover the Amazon forest and a few spaces in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. The Norwegian government is investing $400 million, uh, kroner, which is roughly $40 million, uh, $43 million. In, uh, uh, we're investing that in high quality photos and sharing it with uh, the world. Um, 
for anyone to analyze and 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 uh, um, and disseminate to analyze what forest has been cut down, what has been done with the the the, uh, the areas, and we're trying to be that sort of un unattached uh, third party that that will produce content that has no bias, uh, if that is possible. That is. Uh, I'm currently now working with this project to secure uh, the licensing on this. Right now, it's a license that is very close to uh, CC BY with an NC clause attached to it. Uh, but it's a really amazing project that that sort of both could be reckoned over time as a, as an educational resource when it's when it's being uh, utilized for education, but also for research uh, purposes, of course, um, for anyone that wants to research the development of 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 the rainforest. Uh, the Global Digital Library, um, I've talked about this before, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. This is my, my, my main, um, main time occupier. We've increased the quality piece of the content to now 65 languages. Uh, and we have a new stack of content portfolio just be, uh, to, be, to be launched. And we're, we're looking to uh, uh, have 80 languages by the end of, of this year. Also, this is uh, an educational resource for early grade reading, mainly, um, where we have some, some hints of math. Werner mentioned Colibri, which is a really, really important part of the offline bid that we're doing. So if you go for using Colibri, like Werner has, has, has done with his team, you will also get the GDL resources now bundled into Colibri. We're collaborating with them. And as we are e uh, increasing the portfolio of content on our platform, the Colibri team is they're tapping into our APIs and and offering that as an offline uh, possible. Um, I just want to mention this because this is my passion nowadays. I am we're working on a an interactive game experience uh, for kids where we also can measure because this is a is very it's, it's a global problem that you, you in it you're you're about to learn to read and you're unable to attend school. You have parents that are not literate. You need to be um, in a situation where we or someone can measure what you can. So measure your skills and then offer resources based on that. We are now working with the World Bank and, and a team at, at MIT to create interactive literacy games that will measure the skills of the child without tracking it too much or tracking uh, personal data at all actually, and then providing resources that are relevant for the child at that moment. And that's going to be something we're doing uh, research on for the next two and a half years. But our first trials are, are planned for just over the new year. And as you see, there are monsters and there are pirates in this in this sort of uh, um, space. And it's all going to be open sourced. The content and the data behind it is going to be under Creative Commons. And there are also going to be H5P versions of these games so that anyone, also you guys, Werner, can tap into the games and use them in your language. That's it. I, I try to cover a lot. Um, um, thanks for, for listening.